Welcome back. And welcome to the second part of the AI and society, the continuation from this morning. So now, as promised, what we're going to do, so we had more of a discussion this morning, so a bit of an, uh, an introduction. Now we're going to try to look a bit more in depth at some of these things that we've been discussing. And I want to say the presentation that, uh, that you're going to hear now is quite heavily influenced by the one from uh, Mulligan, Coley and Kroll from uh, NIPS from this year. So there was a, a tutorial panel on, uh, on basically uh, AI and society at NIBS. Uh, do you guys know what NIBS is? It's uh, probably the biggest conference in machine learning, uh, which is in, was in Montreal this year. It was uh, about a month ago. And so I, I was there and I liked the way that they were doing it and it kind of meshed with what we were discussing. So I think it's also a good idea that to, to kind of take inspiration from the people who've been working in the field uh, since a long time. So I, just so that you know, you might see some slides that you might have maybe seen somewhere else. Let's go back to the motivation of what, uh, what we want to do, right? So we established this morning that we want to build technology that people can trust and that somehow support human values. And when we want to do that, what comes up as a kind of common wish list of requirements is often things like fairness, accountability, transparency, and interpretability. And there's more and more of these kind of big terms that one can have, but this is just a bit like an overview. So as you said, this is kind of like a lofty goal, right? It, 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 it's nice to say I want something to be fair, but as we've seen from this morning with the game as well, it's not really clear what that actually means. And so we have a saying in Switzerland is being a bit like a donkey in front of the mountain, which means being in front of a big task and not really knowing what to do. And this is kind of like, looks a little bit like how AI and ML communities are standing right now. And I would also say that we're in a bit of a curious situation currently. So this is obviously not the first time that someone thinks about these problems. It's not like AI and ML are inventors of these kind of challenges. These are challenges that have been existing in society forever. And many disciplines have looked at these things quite extensively. But for some reason, we're perfectly at ease with saying something. If I want to build a bridge, I need an engineer. No one is going to argue with that. But we're also bizarrely happy with saying, we build social, uh, social applications, we build AI, and somehow only scientists and engineers are involved in this. And that shouldn't be the case. That really shouldn't be the case because we as a community are not very well suited to think about these problems because we just don't have the experience and we just don't spend the time doing that. So one of the reasons that I have is an explanation a little bit of having tried to do some of these things like going to uh, collaborate with social scientists is one of the things that m makes it a little bit hard sometimes is that we really do speak different languages. So this leads to a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of useless arguments as well where even like terms that seem trivial to everybody will not be understood the same way uh, on both sides of the aisle. So that's certainly part of the reason of why we, it, it might be a bit difficult, but from experience, it's not a reason to stop doing it. You really just need to expand the space and be a bit more patient, and then a common language can develop. So if you wanted to look a little bit about what other disciplines have to share about this, the most obvious part to start, obviously, would be to say, let's look at how ethics is discussed. And we could look at philosophy, we could look at all these kind of things. And I would prefer not to do this, because ethics is very, very heavily influenced on, has a heavy focus on people, on individuals. But many issues around AI and ML are not about people being unethical. It's not like the person making the algorithm is thinking, I'm going to be a total douche and like, just do something random. That's not how most things work. Actually, most things work is we simply don't think about what happens after. So we're being very short-sighted in most of the applications that we do. So ethics is not a very useful manner to look at this. I'm not saying ethics is not important. This is a very important field. There's a lot of things we can learn from it. But for many of the applications, this might not be the center of things we want to be looking at. So instead, we, we should remember what is 
kind of the goal of what we want to do, right? So in, in many applications, the social applications, we want to make sure that the future does not look the same as the past. Because so as some people mentioned in the morning session, right now society has a certain set of biases which, which are included in it. And if we just keep on modeling data that we have now, we will just simply keep the situation as it is, which is not very useful, right? Because then we don't really advance at all. So yeah, in other words, we don't want to reproduce current inequalities and biases. So in our analysis of how we basically want to go about these problems, we need to incorporate more the individual, the social, the political, and the organizational dynamics and incentives that surround machine learning on, on AI applications. So the problem basically lies, as we said, in operation, operationalization. So we want to make AI applications which are fair, they're accountable, transparent, and terrible, but we don't know how to define these terms, and especially not in mathematical form in which we could basically build them into a model. And the question is, so, okay, we know we can't do it, so what do we do? And the proposition is basically, let's try to do it anyway. Because even though we know that we cannot really succeed at it, there are still some good reasons to try to do it. And part of these reasons are that it will help at least expose the thinking behind doing it. So it's going to show us some of the limitations of the solutions that we have. And that is better than not having any idea at all. It will also help facilitate the communication between different people and like between different actors in society and even in, within the field of what is actually the goal, what is being pursued, why are these choices made, and uh, and it will also, in the end, facilitate the evaluation. So what does it actually mean to operationalize something? As we said, we basically, I, I like this kind of the distinction between like a theory and observation world. So in a theory world is the world that happens inside your mind and like how you are thinking of things. So let's say we want to think about fairness, you want to think about a specific application, you have an idea in your head about the causal relationship, what are the, the things that exist in the world, but they are not at the level of observation. To do something, to have data, you have to basically make this into a real thing. So for example, develop a program or develop a treatment. You have to define a certain set of steps. And for the same, the same is true for observation. So basically, if you want to do measurements, you have to define what is the process of measurement and all these kind of things. What comes out when you do this, and let's say this is now for an example of fairness, is you'll end up with a set of outcome-based metrics. Okay, so this is uh, something called like a fairness tree, where you have a certain set of measures at the bottom here, depending on the situations that you found, uh, that, that you face. So, for example. Yeah, we can, we can walk it a bit, like, okay, you want your solution to be fair in disparate representation. So basically, do you want representation or you want to minimize errors? Is it uh, punitive or is it assistive? So basically, is your, uh, your application having a negative effect on people? So can it hurt people? Then what kind of measure might be, uh, might be the most appropriate? So this is kind of traditionally what we've done, and this is how we try uh, to, to assess fairness right now. But there are a few challenges with this approach. So this force definition and operation is not really solving the problem because as we said and we've seen in the morning, human values are quite complicated and they're multifaceted and they resist definition. That's one problem. The second problem we've seen is there's something like a contested concept. We might agree on what, that something is important, but we might not agree on what it means in practice for this to be important. And then there is actually a third kind of very interesting thing. Even when we abstractly agree on what is important and sometimes even what it would mean to be important, it might not work in practice because it might not apply equally to all. And I want to give you a little bit of a famous example there to kind of situate that. And it's about recidivism risk rating of criminals. So basically when someone gets arrested, there will be a, a score that be calculated basically to um, try to assess how likely is someone going to be rearrested in a certain time frame in the future? What does recidivism mean? So, re that's it. It's basically to be re um, rearrested. It doesn't mean that it's a necessary crime, but if, you, if, if you're, you've been arrested, you've committed a crime, the recidivism is basically will you 
do another crime within a uh, commit another crime within a certain time frame. Is that the same as reoffending? Yeah, I would say in this case, this is pretty much the same thing. I wouldn't, yeah, I would say so. So this is a common thing to do and it's a reasonable thing, I guess, for society to do because you, you want to try to see, okay, what can we, how to deal with this particular case, all right? So when we do this, one of the findings from, from the states is that if we calibrate this measure, right, to basically the actual risk levels of people, we find that minorities tend to have a much higher risk. And that's because in the data, in the population, it's true that minorities get higher, get arrested more in general. And this is also true regardless of whether there's an actual arrestable offense being committed or not. It's just minorities get arrested more often. So if you just do this, there will be a much more like unfairly high scores given to, uh, to minorities. And that seems unfair, right? This seems like a flaw in the system. This is something that we wouldn't want to see. But if we try to address this, one would say, okay, well, that's pretty simple. Let's just try to correct for this, right? We kind of know by what margin or like in what proportions this is, is the case. We could just try to build that into the measure, right? But then you get a different kind of problem, which is suddenly scores, the score does not mean the same thing for different people anymore. And this offends a different sense of fairness, which is we want people to be treated equally. So the, the, from, from what I understand, the application of this is, is often, for example, uh, can you give uh, probation to someone or not? Which is a, a reasonable question. I mean, you, you don't want to give probation to someone if, it, uh, if the risk of uh, recommitting a crime is very high because that would just endanger society. At the same time, you don't want to uh, lock someone up who has reasonable chances of, uh, of basically being a one-time offender, right? So yeah, to, to get back to this then, you, we have agreed in the beginning that fairness was important. We agreed what it meant, but in the sense, it still does not seem to work. We try to do it, but we, because of the way the data is structured, because of the way that the operation works, we, we cannot come up to with a score or a measure that seems to satisfy our ideas of what fairness means. So what can we conclude from something like this? It seems that possibly mathematical correctness is not actually enough to try to capture human values. This might not be the central point. And that's obviously not very nice for people in a, in a scientific or like a mathematical background because we kind of like to think of numbers solve everything, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And Maybe the problem is already kind of included in the environment. And I think deep down, everyone kind of knows that. The world is biased in various forms. So obviously, applications cannot just not take that into account. They have to be included in the general environment in which they operate. So now we have this situation where a common thinking pathway for, a, for, a, for, a, for an ML or AI researcher or engineer is going to be, my problem is solved if I can build a model that adequately represents the world and that my data somehow, rep uh, no, sorry, that the model represents my data and my data somehow represents the world. And I'm not interested basically on dealing with all of these kind of messy issues that come with living in a social environment. Basically, this is not my business. But as I said this morning, I think this is a very, very dangerous way of thinking. Because there is a kind of a, let's, let, let's think of a famous example about how this might not work that well. After uh, the Second World War, when uh, basically we just discovered fission and the idea of being able to build uh, nuclear bombs was a very real thing, scientists for once were really in the spotlight of saying that having a very big role in trying to influence how social policy worked, right? Because the people who build the things are from the same group than the people who make the theory for building things possible, right? So basically, if you're in your lab and you, you, you discover something, and you're an engineer or a scientist, 
the person who's going to put that into practice is very likely also an engineer and a scientist. So basically, it's within the group to kind of come up to a sort of culture of what will we accept as an application and what won't we. And that, I think that's it. The reaction to, uh, to, to the nuclear uh, armament was a, quite an interesting one. Physicists, for one, seem to have done a pretty good job at it. It doesn't seem to have lasted very long because we seem to be uh, restarting the conversation again. But at least for a certain amount of time, activism and like just engagement, public, uh, public engagement by uh, by scientists, have led to a sort of limitation of the problem. So basically, there were, there there was a non-proliferation treaty that was signed, and these kind of all these kind of things they did matter, and they were quite publicized. And I think something similar is invisible. It, it can, could could be thought of for AI as well. So it's not necessary that basically we build applications that go awry. We still have the choice of doing and publicly state that we won't do that. And so the reason why, ex exactly as a summary, I think this is not necessarily a very good state of affairs is because the problems that we're solving there, as I said, they're not technical problems only. They're, in the end, socio-technical problems. And we need to take this into account. So now let's go, let's go back a little bit on, uh, on, on the view of fairness. So we, we've talked about this idea of, okay, if we had some measures, this would solve the problem. We tried it out. We had these outcome-based measures. It didn't really work. Maybe it's, we're not looking at this correctly. And a different view on what fairness, for example, could be is that we can take this from, uh, from law. So fairness is not simply a question of the outcome. It's not, something is not only fair by the fact that its outcome is fair. It is also very much a process. And um, the law obviously has one very ex big example of, of, uh, of this, uh, as fairness being a process instead of a rule, is due process. So the fact of how you get to a judgment is very important. It's not simply what the, what the judgment is. So basically the idea that you can represent yourself is an important aspect. The idea that you can contest the judgment. And now, I hope it kind of dawns to you that like, these are the same kind of questions we're asking now, right? When we, when we talk about AI and ML applications, it's like, okay, so, but there has been, I don't know, uh, an algorithm made to judge whether or not people should get a loan. And you, some people get rejected. What can they do? At this stage, basically nothing. We're just leaving it up. Okay, well, by machine said this, machine said that there's nothing we can do, which is not a very smart idea, because that's it. It's going to backfire in the end. Another, uh, another good example of, uh, uh, of such a process, for example, voting. It doesn't, maybe not something that comes to, uh, to mind very, very fast, but fairness as a process in voting is basically just the fact of being able to participate, to be able to influence the process, makes it fairer. Even though you might not agree with the outcome of it, it's still a fair process simply by the fact that people can participate. And then there is a very important thing that I think is going to come up more and more is, uh, from the GDPR, is, um, so the privacy, uh, data privacy rules in, uh, in, in the, the European Union has, uh, has made. And they have a very strong claim about that individuals are only, uh, that basically you can only be judged by other individuals. So basically they're making a very strong claim against judgments made by, uh, by algorithms or in a, in a completely automatic way. Because what they're saying is the, a type of harm that we often don't think about when we talk about, uh, uh, about issues with fairness and so on is the idea of the human dignity in the whole process. It's, it's different to be judged by someone than to be judged by a faceless algorithm. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So basically, if you want to make algorithms in the, in the EU right now, it probably will have to, uh, you'll probably have to take that into account anyway. But it would be good if we didn't have to kind of rely on these particular frameworks and kind of come up with a process and how we want to do this collectively. So, as I said as before, right, outcome-based measure basically cannot capture this kind of, of, uh, of, of dynamic because it's about the process in which the decisions are made or uh, the, the actions of the algorithm are done. It's not just the outcome. So what have you said so far? Outcome-based operation not sufficient to properly capture the intricacies that are contained in human values. And 
values can manifest themselves both in outcomes and in processes. And AI and ML researchers cannot evade the responsibility of the ramifications of their algorithm because the algorithms exist in an environment. So let's have a little bit more of a closer look at what this, uh, this uh, environment is. So right now, I would say like a global kind of like uh, generic data uh, pay pipeline for, uh, for ML AI is you, you start, you have some data, you build a model based on some chosen architecture. You define a way to train it, so a, 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 and a, a loss that is associated with it, and then you validate wh what you've done. And we t generally tend to think of the loss function as basically, and a bit the architecture as being the places where you can enforce desired behavior, right? Because depending on your loss and your architecture, you're limiting the kind of space of models that are possible, right? So you're basically regularizing your, uh, your, your, your model. But we often kind of forget a, quite an important fact about data and, and the nature of data in this. And that is, data is actually not the truth. We are always treating data as if it was some sort of proxy for a real phenomena. But data is an abstraction, just as models are an abstraction of data. And the reason why I'm saying this is it doesn't seem like data has this kind of idea of like, right, it, it feels objective because you have these numbers, you have these things. It, 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 sounds, it feels like very much there is something which is immutable. But abstracting the world into data itself is actually a really hard problem. And that is because all empirical data depends on a mechanism of measurement. You have to measure something to, uh, to be able to have data. And the way that you measure things alters what you get. So there is an interesting uh, kind of a, uh, anecdote about that. So I forgot the name of the person. It was a, a researcher. He had an interesting question, which is, can you predict the likelihood of two countries going to war by the length of the border that they share? Seems like a reasonable question. It's a pretty simple question to address with a common machine learning, right? Or even you can do a regression problem for that. So you collect data, you start measuring what is the length of the border between the different countries. And you try to figure out, can you predict a war, a likelihood of war based on that. So when he was doing that, he suddenly realized that there's something bizarre. So the border between Portugal and Spain was somehow 200 kilometers longer in Spain than in Portugal. And that sounds like a very weird thing, right? Because it's unlikely that because you walk from Portugal to Spain, the border suddenly got 200 kilometers longer, right? So what happened, basically? How is this possible? Especially for something like a measurement of distance. I mean, if, if we think something is objective, is like a measurement of distance is very highly up in that, right? And the reason why this happens is actually pretty simple. It depends on the way you measure the border. So the way that you make a measurement of a border is you take aerial photographs and then you trace a path. But the way basically you, you overlap and the quality of the images that you use and the way that you, you, you basically put all the measurement together has a pretty eff a big effect. And this 200 kilometers is about 20% of the total length of the border. So if we let this sink in a little bit, right? So if we cannot even trust a measurement like something like length to be an invariant, then why would we think that non-observable constructs, just for example, risk, is something that we will be able to capture in data in a very objective way? And there's a, maybe I want to add one very small aspect from this, which is I always found a very interesting kind of thing from philosophy of science, which is data actually does not exist without theory. It is called the th it's basically theory Latin. What that means is, you're, we, in, in a naive view of science, we think of, we have data and we build theories to explain the data. But that's not actually what happens. You have theory, and within that theory, in that theoretical framework, you observe certain things. And then you build things on that, and basically it's kind of a circular process. Because, as we said, any way of measurement depends on the agreement of what the words for the measurement mean. And this is a theoretical con uh, construct. This is not an objective construct, right? Something like length depends on how you define length. If you were to look at the uh, very famous example, for example, of uh, fractals, you could say the length of a border is infinitely long because it's an ill-defined measure in the end, actually. It's not, uh, it's not a right property. 
because you can always zoom in and say, ah, okay, yeah, this is a self-similar process, right? There is no finite length. So okay, we're at a bit of a, of a weird position where now we cannot even trust data anymore. So what do we do? So we, we, we accept a lot of the concept and construct that we want to capture with them, and they're non-observables. They're, they're, they're purely theoretical. So, and when we know this, how can we assess whether operationalizations are actually accurate for uh, translations of the construct? So basically, how do we know that what we want to measure is what we actually measure? And how do we know that the interventions that we make actually do the things we think they do, right? So again, this is not some sort of special finding about ML or AI. This is something that is just an inherent problem of doing science, of living in the world. It's just we don't have access to objective reality. We always have access only to projections of it. And so it's again worthy, I think, to look at social sciences to see how they deal with this. Because I like this idea of a, uh, that critical realists kind of defend. Is that you have an objective reality, but you don't have access to it. And sciences like physics or so on, they're quite close to this. So the operation is a, little, is a little bit easier. And the more you go higher up in the pyramid, the more you have interrelated kind of things, right? So in social sciences, there is a lot of different things that come together to make a concept just a, like risk or fairness or all these kind of things. There's a lot of different variables. So it they're certainly very well placed in trying to teach us a little bit about how one can even approach that. And the way that they approach that is by something that they call construct validity. And what construct validity means is exactly what I was saying before, is basically assessing how accurately does your idea or, or, or theory translate into an actual process or a measure. Are we measuring what we want to measure? Is, it, is our data representing what we think it represents? And to establish that, you have to, to do a, a few things. So first of all, you have to position your construct within a sem what they call a semantic net, is a, just a net of meaning. You have to basically look at the words that you want to use right? when you, when you want to describe the situation and look, define how this is related to similar words around it. Then the next thing you have to do is you have to try to provide some evidence that actually you can control the operation that you have. So does basically the, the thing work in the way that you have? You have to try to bring arguments for that. And then that's it. They basically provide evidence that data support your theoretical view. So again, if we go back to this, if we define our setting in the, in, in the kind of theory space, when we operationalize it, we go from the theory and we, we basically instantiate something in the real world. Like we define a certain uh, intervention and we, def we, we define certain measurements, we get data from it. And construct validity basically is just, can we go back from this and map this back to the ideas that we had in the beginning? And that basically is probably what we should be looking for. Because right now in machine learning, there is a big community that somehow seems to say that data is magically going to solve this. So just having more data is going, to re is going to solve whether or not, like basically all these problems are going to go away if we have the right data. But this cannot be because, again, if we look at the structure of how motivation and purpose works, is it's a human who defines what we want. Data is not going to do this. Data is a way to basically try to achieve a goal but it's not the end in itself. So data cannot inform you about what you should do. You need to think. Basically, what I'm saying is there's no replacement for thinking. Just having good theoretical understanding or good practical understanding of, of algorithms is never gonna solve a problem because you'll know, you won't know what you're solving. So these are some of the key take home messages that's it, that I would like to have from here, which is like there's basically no substitute for thinking. That both data and models, they're abstractions, and we should really never forget this, because this is something very easy to forget. We, we deal with data all the time. We start to think the proxies are the thing in it itself. That's a normal kind of thing, but we really, you, that's why we need to keep on reminding ourselves that this is not true. 
And that's it. I really want to want to emphasize that building models or even any applications has also engraved some responsibility for how it works. You also expect the engineer who builds a bridge to build it in a way that it's not going to collapse. So why would software engineering and like ML and AI be different from this? Why would people not be able to trust that this is work that is reliable, that is tested, that has some sort of ethical code behind it? And for some reason, we're not there yet. And as I said in the morning, I think building good AI and ML applications is a very socio-technical problem. So it means that we really should try to reach out and get input from different fields of study. And I'm going to end a little bit on a personal anecdote, a project that I was running for a few, uh, for a few years. It's the idea that when I, when I used to be in school, right, people who, who like sciences, they usually don't find sciences very hard. And it's hard to understand why other people sometimes struggle with these concepts. So I was very curious in saying, I think the reason why people didn't understand uh, or, or uh, a sizable portion of people didn't really understand and enjoy science in high school is because it wasn't explained properly. So I said, well, now that I'm at PhD and I have a lot of free time, I might, why not try to see if this is actually true? So we, were, we, we started um, an outreach project where we would go to high schools uh, in underprivileged areas and basically try to talk about science. So the idea was, by somehow talking about science, and we, we, could, we could increase the acceptance, I guess, of it, and basically yeah, make it more acceptable in society, more, more interesting for people. And we started in exactly this kind of naive way in which we also do ML now, which is, OK, we're a bunch of neuroscientists, which is, I don't know, call some schools and go there and talk. And obviously, this is not how it works. You can do this, but it's just completely useless to do that. Because what kind of pretension do we need to basically think that we can just go in front of people and just teach things, and then suddenly, magically, I don't know, people are going to find this really cool. And we went through a very long, it was a pretty long process, two, three years of like refining problems, of trying to figure out, OK, what is it that we actually want to achieve? OK, we started with this idea we would like people to have uh, better critical thinking abilities. So we, we ended reaching out to education, and we told them that, and they just started laughing. And they were like, what is so funny? I mean, people are not critically thinking. We need to do something about this. But they were just like, who are you? I mean, this is not a new thing. <laughs> like, this is in. This is ages of education. They've been thinking about this problem. And we, like a, like a bunch of chumps, just come walk in. It's just like as if we discovered something. No, this is not. And through talking, you basically also realize why this is not even a good question. Because we didn't even know what we meant when we said critical thinking. It's just some sort of, yeah, within sciences, I guess, people kind of have a fuzzy understanding and an under, like a common agreement that this is somehow an important faculty. But we don't know what it means in the end. We didn't have any efforts. So we started working with them. It took six months of like a long discussion to even get to terms with what can actually maybe be a pursuable goal. And we ended up making some reasonably good sessions, I would say. It obviously did not have the impact that we thought it would have. And it was a great lesson in the end. And I think a lot of this kind of reflects a little bit about how ML and AI works in the end. It's if we're going to approach problems, complex problems, in this kind of very single-minded way, we're doomed to fail, and it's going to be really only up to us to blame ourselves. I mean, this is not going to be an accident. Basically, we cannot say, ah, oh, this is, this should, this could, no, no one could have seen it coming. No, if we, if we mess this up, we basically deliberately mess it up. Because we're either too lazy or too arrogant to say that, we should probably include other people and to also I basically look a little bit inside ourselves. And on this, I want to give you some more further readings, which is um, there's been a, there, there's been quite some work actually that's being done on a, around the, the the idea of ethics, responsibility in ML and AI, which reflect on the kind of things that I, I wanted to share today. So there's just recently something called the Montreal Declaration that came out, which is a set of guidelines a little bit about how we might want to build more uh, socially good applications. 
So I really re recommend that we have a look at this collectively. Then there is a paper that was mentioned actually in, a, in a, um, one of the sessions at, uh, at NIPS this year that I found very interesting that you, I, I recommend you read. It's called The Moral Character of Cryptographic Work. And it's kind of an, more of an opinion piece where uh, a cryptographer is basically asking why is the field of cryptography, like the academic field, somehow completely oblivious to the fact that this has very big political ramifications. So it's kind of the same problem that we, I was talking about with AI and ML. And he has some interesting, uh, interesting takeaways, and if you want to read that's it, a little bit about the history, about how the nuclear treaty worked, then, like the, or the advocacy by scientists in favor of that, he, he has some sections about that as well. Then, uh, if you're interested in, that's it, in trying to figure out a little bit more about how uh, social science do research and like construct validity or so, I recommend uh, this, this site. I, I liked it. It's, I have to really, really disclaim, give a big disclaimer, though, is I am no social scientist. Like, I think no one here is. So, best, better than listen to what I say, go and meet the people, talk to them. They will have a much deeper and much more profound understanding of how this works and what are the intricacies. This was a very big overview only, right, of how the methods work. And it's my, basically a lot of things that I extracted also from how they work, so it's best if you really try to, uh, to also go, yeah, validate them by yourself. And then there is obviously a big literature that I think most people kind of heard of or have seen before. Uh, Sujay talked about one of the books before on generally like about on measurement and biases. So I think Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman is a very interesting read. Uh, I kind of enjoyed Predictably Irrational as well from, uh, from Dan Ariely. It's more about behavioral economics. It's basically how do people make decisions in a, in a, in a social environment. Some quite in interesting stuff as well. Then if you, that's it, you want to try to understand a little bit about how science is actually viewed from the point of view of philosophy of science, then I really recommend this book called What is this thing called science? It's a, it's a very concise and interesting uh, introduction into uh, you know, how uh, yeah, basically other people view science from the outside, basically how philosophers view it. And then there's this online, basically the fairness tree that I was showing you is actually coming from an online resource from uh, the University of Chicago that uh, allows you to audit your, uh, your data sets if you want. So basically you, you define the measures, like what kind of uh, fairness criteria you want to you wanna evaluate, and you can uh, upload it and they'll, they'll give you a rating, basically, or they'll break it out for you. So that's it. I hope this was a, it, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of a different perspective and something to think about. And so now I would like to prepare a little bit for the lab. There is a few, oh yeah, again, please fill out the, the Google feedback form. Did you, we talked about that before, right? I mentioned that? The form, did I mention that? I don't remember. So anyway, there's a there's a link uh, in your in your materials. There's a, there's a link with a with 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 a, with a sheet for a, for a, for the different feedback forms. So it would be nice if you if you could fill that out. So we we're gonna go again now into a lecture by Suji, right? About my, some more uh, physiology of of neuroscience. But uh, after that, for the lab, that's it. If we want to discuss some of these themes and try to look at some applications more in detail. Um, I think there were four people that, or four groups that proposed some ideas. I'm going to take this off the board now because we've, uh, we, we've captured it down in a, in a sheet. And basically just write them up in, a, in the break. And then if people want to discuss it, you can basically sign up to those groups and we'll do a, a group discussion around that. Okay? The next session is a bit tricky. You have, to, you have to be careful not to be carried away. And Pascal's session actually helps me because what he's essentially saying is we cannot stop thinking and let AI do the thinking. That's the, that's the message. I, the, and he, he told us different ways to go about it, but the message is we can't expect AI to think for us. Right? And there's some trivial reasons why, because we, we built that thing. So how can it think? Uh, on behalf of us, on behalf of us, that we couldn't think of something that we think of. The message is 
Critical thinking is important. We need to think about things. Now, the reason I say that is it's easy to get carried away from this session because we're going to, I'm going to show you some fun things, some cool things. And because something is cool, it's not a reason to pursue it, right? And because neuroscience is good, because it's cool to study the brain, that's not really a reason to study it. The reason to study has to be some sort of a question that you want to answer. You, you, you don't want to do science because it's cool. You want to do science because you are curious about something. Does it help you answer some question? So keep that in mind. Um, I brought up this slide because this is how we ended, right? Uh, how can we ask some questions about intelligence? And we said, maybe if we um, think about learning, then we can get at this question. And then we, we read a paper, and then we discussed the ideas about internal model or cognitive map. And in, this, in that particular scenario, there was a cognitive map in, a, uh, in the situation of a navigation. So we'll, go, we'll, we'll narrow down and focus in the case of navigation in a, in a bigger theme. And I'll show you some, some data from the brain on, on this cognitive map in navigation. But to understand that, we have to understand what I mean by data, what, what does neural firing mean. So that aspect will be a little bit different from navigation, but we'll get to that. And get to navigation eventually. Now, before we get there, there are big questions, there are interesting questions, and there is a complex system. Right? All these things are it's easy to say, actually. You can ask a question about intelligence, you can ask a question like, oh, how does the brain work? I really want to know how the brain works. Or I want to know how an AI works, for that matter. But how, how do we actually go about it? It's not that trivial to understand a complex system. Right? How do you even start? Do you start putting electrodes inside the brain, and somehow magically you know how the brain works. So this question came up quite heavily in the 1970s, when computer vision was sort of starting. Right? Uh, we had powerful computers, and there were cameras, and people started analyzing images. And they quickly realized that it's not that easy. You know, Some of the things our visual system does we don't even realize it's so trivial. If, you, if someone moves from left to right, we can tell, right? Something is moving. It's so easy. And why, why, is, why, why, is, uh, why is anyone making such a big deal about it? So we must, it's so easy, we must be able to build it. And when computer vision scientists started building that, it was a disaster. You don't really know how to start. So it, it turned out it was a really difficult problem. Same thing, you can ask the same thing about the brain. How do we even start thinking about how the brain works? But let, let's focus on answering the question, or how to go about answering the question. So David Marr was a vision scientist at MIT in the 70s, and he wrote a very influential book called Vision. And in the first chapter of that book, he describes uh, this approach. And it's not just him, it's uh, Thomas Poggio also independently came up with this method. Uh, Poggio is currently at MIT as well. And these guys worked on vision for a while, and this is one approach to study a complex system. And they call it levels. We can, we can call it whatever we want, but these are three steps, basically. But it's, it doesn't have to be sequential steps. These are three levels. The first level, how do you start? The, level, for the first level is the computational theory. If you have a question in mind, or if you have a problem you want to solve, you have to think about what what are some of the logics that can be used to solve this problem? And what is the goal that you're trying to achieve? Or if it's a system, what is the input and output of this system? If, if you can build a system to solve this problem, what would be the input and output? So these, are, these all fall under the, under the computational theory. So until you have a theory, you can't really build anything like that or, or try to understand to build something, uh, something like that. After you have computational theory, then you can think about representation and algorithm, right? Now, this level is basically is, is mainly about representation and mainly about computation. What that means is you have, you have defined a computational theory. Based on that, you have some, you can, you can come up with some variables. Now, if there's a variable, then how is that represented in that machine? If it's the brain, how is that represented in the brain? So let's say your theory is, OK, the brain uses something like a cognitive map. Right? Now we can, go, we can uh, bring that to, uh, to cognition. 
Well, I skipped something. <laughs> um, hold that thought about cognitive <coughs> map. First, let, let's apply this, uh, these levels for uh, cognition. But before that, I should also talk about level three. Uh, level three is really about implementation, hardware implementation. So after you get to level two, level three is basically physical realization. So until, until you have level one, uh, for level one and two, actually, you, it's all, all based on theory and whatever you construct it, right? It has nothing to do with the physical realization, whether it is the brain or it is the machine. You can actually do it in your head and in, in, on a piece of paper, as Suresh sir says. And when you reach level three, then you can actually think about if, uh, if, if it can be realizable on a machine, on a chip, or in terms of neuroscience or brain, you can ask, how does the, neur uh, the neuron, how, how do the neurons and synapses in the brain actually implement this method? So these are the three levels of, um, it's called Mars, Mars three level of approaching a problem, or, or, or a problem to understand a complex system. Now you can, you can apply this to cognition, for example. So what is the problem that the cognition has to solve, and what is the logic? The cognition is broad, right? And we, you can pick a particular problem uh, within cognition. Once you, ha once you have set the goal, set the problem, and, and possible ways to do it, you can ask, how can we do that? So you can come up with a way to do that, algorithmically, right? And if you're satisfied with that, then you can think, how can that be implemented? Now, now let's go to the problem of rat navigation, right? So we learned about this old theory, stimulus response theory, and the internal model theory. So how do we define the problem? Maybe, maybe I should not have written the answer and may, made you say it. Um, so one way to do it is how do we know where we are in physical space and what, when we move around, how do we keep track of our position? This is a reasonable question to answer, a question to ask. We navigate all the time, not just rats, we also navigate. We go through cities, we travel, but how do we actually know where we are? And how do we, we even plan things, right? It'll probably take about 10 minutes for me to go from here to here. How do we do that? It's not very easy to answer. So there are two possible logic based on the, the theories we learned. Logic one is you basically reproduce what you've memorized. Yesterday I went to the hotel. I took a certain path. And maybe I can just reproduce that. So I, I memorized that exact path in some way. And tomorrow, if I have to go there again, or today, I just reproduce that. That's one way to do it. That's, uh, that's one theory. So, so, so that theory is basically, whatever you experience you have, you create some sort of memory of that. And then you just reproduce that you have to, if you have to do it. Logic two is, OK, I've done some traveling before. I've gone around the city. Based on that, I build a map of the city. It may not be the perfect map, but I have some sort of map. Now, if I have to create a new trajectory, a new path, I use that map, and I, and I do it. It turns out the rats do that in that particular scenario, right? So the, lo the second logic is, is the idea of having an internal model of your experience that is a bit general, a bit broader than if you don't have the map and you just have this strict memory. Now, we can think, we don't know which one is, which one is true, right? We can think the implication of these two logics, and we can sort of predict what would happen. Uh, you can design experiments based on this. So once you have the theory, now it gives you room to do certain other things. Now, if you want to build a navigating agent, now you can come up with algorithms based on this theory. You can come with al algorithm to solve this navigation problem using logic one, or you can do it using logic two. So what would be a possible algorithm if you use logic one? to solve a navigation problem. What algorithm can you use to do it? Or logic too, if you can think of uh, an algorithm that can take the second logic and solve the problem. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Memorization. That's what, memorization. Yeah. So in a, 
so he said it's a you 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 have a special memory where you can record all the all the events that happened in sequence when you took that path before. You just keep a really uh, good record of that, and then you just reproduce that. Right? That's what you can write an algorithm to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so he said. So there, uh, these, these sound similar, but there's there's a key difference, right? Pascal said we can keep track of all the landmarks that we saw when we took the uh, path, and we record that, and we reproduce. So we start walking, and we keep we look at the landmarks and take particular turns. He said that we don't use the landmarks; we use internal signals. When we take a turn, we know we took a turn. So we take that internal signal. If we keep track of all of this, so I take 15 steps, I make a right turn, then I take five steps, then I do this, then I do that. So in terms of number of steps and number of turns, you can keep track of exactly what you did. Now you just reproduce that. So this is also based on logic one. Right? You have a strict memory of what you did, and then you reproduce that to navigate again. So can anyone, is everyone satisfied with that algorithm? What could be a problem with that? By the way, CIA agents are trained on the second algorithm when they are blindfolded. Oh, okay. Is that is that a finding? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, just a side note in the, in the, in the navigation literature. Or, or yeah, in the navigation literature, this the second approach it's called dead reckoning. It's it's path integration. Actually, a lot of sailors, when they didn't have GPS, they used to use that. Uh, they also used stars and suns, but they had a way to keep track of where the ship was. So the the only way to keep track of your ship if you don't have a GPS or anything, in in I guess in the 1600s, I don't know the date before you had fancy technology, is keep track of how long you went. If, you, if the speed is constant, you know the distance and always keep record of the direction that the uh, ship took. But you, have to take in, you also have to take into account the direction of the wind, so it's more complicated than it sounds. Uh, but if you keep track of all that, you know exactly where you are compared to your starting point. So if you know roughly where, the, where North America is compared to Europe, you can presumably reach there by keeping track uh, of these internal signals. So this is called path integration or dead reckoning. It turns out rats do that too, but then they also they're also not blindfolded, they have other signals, so they, they also presumably have uh, logic 2 built in. So that's why Daniel Kahneman's idea of you have both. And then, uh, uh, yeah. So, one problem of logic 1, you, algorithm based on logic 1, is, I don't know if I want to say it, I want someone to say it. Yeah, it's one to one. So, what does that mean? Yeah. So if someone pushes you a little bit, you're, you're lost, right? Or someone changes the landmark, the shop closes and Pascal is lost, right? So it's not very flexible. But we know that humans are pretty flexible. Rats are pretty flexible. So in terms of how the rats and humans do it, logic one is not the case. But if you want to build, a, build an agent, you can do it based on that theory, right? You can, do, you can build an unflexible agent if, you, if, that's, if that's what you really want. So, so this exercise is to understand what it means to go through these three levels of, um, of, uh, of what? I don't have a word. This is Mars three levels. Um, do you have a question? Yeah. try to solve the problem is to try to solve the problem at different scales at once. It's very rarely that you'll be able to cross different scales, and especially in neuroscience, this, as we'll see probably later, is even more of a problem. Like, there's too many variables if you want to solve the physical, the algorithmic, and the computational at the same time. There's just no chance of arriving in the end. Mm -hmm. So let's go to logic two. What would be an algorithm for logic? Sorry? Path 
so that that would still be logic one, right? If you if you take all possible paths, you can have the memory of all of them. That's uh, that's kind of what deep learning does, right? You you just overfit your model. You keep, you take as much data as possible, and then you can do whatever you want within that. So if you take every single possible path in Kathmandu, you don't need a map of Kathmandu. You know, as soon as you see some kind of stimulus, you can just recreate that path exactly. So that's still logic one. Logic two is you build a map based on some experience, but you build a more general map. That should be able to, uh, that should enable you to take new, tra new trajectories, right? So deep learning architecture is sort of an example of logic one. Based on logic two, one algorithm would be to use Euclidean map, with, which has grids, and use Euclidean geometry to find distances between places. But then, if this is the algorithm, what kind of representation would you need? You need a representation that has some sort of Euclidean geometry, right? What, is the, what does that mean? You need, you need something to represent 2D. You need something to represent grid. You need some computational unit to do vector calculation. So these are the sort of things you would expect if that's, that, that's, that theory is correct and this algorithm is being used. So, th so this way of thinking really puts you in a position where you can make predictions about what to expect in the brain if brain is doing that. Or if you want to design a smart system, what kind of representation you need and what kind of computational unit you have to design. That's why this, uh, this has received a lot of popularity in terms of thinking about a problem. Um, now, do you have any questions about this before? So, so the l last level is really kind of, this is where we go to neuroscience and see in terms of this literature of navigation, do we have some evidence or, no, it's really hard to link this with, <laughs> with AI because you, you see why. Yeah. Um, but before we go there, do we, do we have any questions? It's not easy to grasp this, this idea of three levels of uh, understanding, but it's a very important one. So put your thinking to it and try to understand. Yeah. That's why it's just a theory, right? Yeah. We don't have any proof of it. It's just a theory, and that algorithm is based on the theory. Now, now what's interesting is, well, you, you could argue either way, right? But what's interesting is when you look at the neuroscience literature, there has been some landmark discoveries that indicate that this could represent an Euclidean map. So there have, there have been some discoveries, which I'm going to show later. But that we, that we still don't know that discovery is actually, actually doing Euclidean geometry. We just, it just hints that, okay, maybe this means that. So we can discuss this anytime. So feel free to ask a question. I, uh, or should, I, should we leave some time to think about this or go to neuroscience? Because once, we, once I start neuroscience, I think everyone will just forget and it's like listening to a story. <laughs> okay, so don't forget this. So think, don't get carried away and just be critical and, uh, and be happy to ask, you know, don't hesitate to ask questions. Even though you think it's, it's kind of amazing result or cool result, just think about, okay, how, how does that actually help us understand the brain? Okay, it looks nice. It looks interesting and it looks very new. No one knows things like this existed. But does that actually help us understand the brain? Or does that help us design a better AI? Or even, or, or even does that help us design a fairer AI? <laughs> so, okay, so let's get into the brain. What is actually inside the brain? Do you, how many of you know what a neuron is? How many of you know what are the main parts of a neuron? Yes. Is, how many of you know that neuron is electric? Okay. So nervous system is electric. That's one of the fundamental uh, property of nervous system, right? They communicate through trans transmission of um, ions. Electricity. Um, briefly, the way it happens is, the what is inside the brain? It's neurons and synapses, right? It's, a, it's basically a bunch of fat. If this is a neuron, 
and this neuron links to that neuron, this, this place is called synapse, right? And neuron, they communicate with each other. The way they do it is, at a synapse, you see all these dendrites, it's receiving information from, here, from other neurons. What happens at the, at the dendrite is, it receives some chemicals from another neuron, and that chemical makes the, the you, so any neuro, <laughs> a neuron has a resting potential, it has a voltage, it always sits at a certain voltage, right? When, when stuff happens in the, in the dendrite, some of the voltage channels, uh, vo some of the channels open, ions flow through the channels. When ions flow, what happens? Voltage changes, right? So the resting voltage changes, and there's a, f there's a universal property of neuron when the voltage reaches a certain point, certain threshold, there's this massive flow of ions. It's called action potential. So this neuron fires one action potential. So this action potential is how neurons communicate with each other. So this action potential can only go in one direction. So this is the action hillock. It starts here, and then it travels this way. And so it's hard to explain that in five minutes, but basically it's exchange of ions from outside the neuron and inside the neuron. And this exchange, is, this exchange happens at a local uh, position, at action hillock, and then this just travels up. When you put an electrode here, because it's, an, it's a conducting uh, material, you can actually pick up this change, of, change in uh, ions, right? And you see a cert, certain uh, deflection in your recording. So this deflection, you can kind of uh, uh, understand that, okay, this neuron is firing. So this firing of this neuron can be recorded if you put an electrode and it's really close to the neuron's cell body. You can actually detect this just by putting a conducting sharp electrode down into the brain, right? So this was, uh, this is, this is fairly recent that you can do this in in a in a live animal, right? So people started uh, recording from nervous tissues a long time ago, and they they detected electricity. Then they thought, okay, nervous system is electric, but it was only recently in the 50s where they they were able to design sharp enough electrodes, and they were able to design amplifiers, and they could make animals see at certain things, and then record from their brain while they're looking at things. And even better, they were able to design electrodes that you can actually implant in a rat's brain and make the rat actually navigate around in some arena. So while the rat is doing the tall man's maze, you could record from his brain while he's doing that. So if there's something like representation of Euclidean geometry in the brain, you could go and look for it. Right, if it's possible to record from the brain. Now, okay, how do we start? Where do we start? Let's go back a little bit. The function of the brain is modular. So this this idea is pretty old, not that not that new, but it's very uh, it's very useful and powerful. If we if we just take sensory area, when I say sensory area, this part of the brain is sensing. This part of the brain. If you record from neuron there, there is, it responds to certain senses. So this, this guy whose face and hand you can see, he's called a homunculus man. What that means is this part of the brain is sensitive to all these parts of the body. So this blue is sensory cortex. If you go and insert some electrodes here, you can see the neuron firing if you, if you touch that part of the uh, body, for example. You can put it that way. Adjacent to it is motor cortex, where the map is similar. So if you put an electrode here and you inject some current, that means you activate that neuron. The person feels sensation in that corresponding location in their body. Right? So if you, if you go here and you actually inject some electrode, his hand is going to move or he's going to feel something on his hand. So th this way, your sensation has been mapped into the sensory cortex of the brain. This is the sensory and motor, right? Now you can think of other functions that we do. And it was found actually pretty early in the 19th century that people had, so people got stroke and they had lesions in their brain. It turns out that if they had lesions in this part of the brain, this temporal area, it's called Winnicke's area because this is the guy who discovered that people with lesions here 
they could not comprehend language very properly. They could speak, but they could not understand language. There were other groups of patients that had lesion in the brain over here. It's called Broca's area, and they could not produce language. They could, they could think, they could write, they could understand language, but they could not speak. So Broca's area is known as this language pro speech production area, and this is known as uh, Winnicke's area, which is a speech comprehension area. Now you can ask a critical question here. Does anyone have a question? Does anyone remember the story of the elephant and uh, uh, seven blind men? You don't know the story? Okay. There's seven people, and there's an elephant. The people are blind, right? And it's, it's in front of them. So one person goes near the trunk and goes like, oh, oh, what is this? This must be a, what is it for trunk? Oh, this must be a tree. <laughs> One, go, one guy goes to the, uh, the tail, and he's like, oh, this is a tail. This must be a rope, a really big rope. And one goes to the ear, oh, he must be a tall guy, and he thinks it's a nanglo. What's a nanglo in English? It's like a pan or something, right? But none of them are right, because it's not a rope or a pan or a tree, right? So in the same sense, you, can, you cannot go to the brain and say, oh, so this part of the brain is doing this. So the function of uh, the speech must be something in there. Maybe it is, but that, does that tell you anything about how the, how the speech is produced in the brain? And this, this is in the 1850s, right? So we can give them some slack. I mean, there, we didn't know much about brain back then, so it was a very useful information to know, actually. But if you look at state-of-the-art neuroscience, it's not much different. So you put people in a scanner, and they're doing certain tasks, and certain part of the brain lights up. And you know, oh, this part of the brain is responsible for this behavior that the person is doing. OK, that's fine. We have another area that maybe is for navigation. So does that tell us how navigation works? Do we understand how computation for navigation happens? Not really. We just know that part of the brain might be involved somehow. And it's not, it's not even that clear cut, right? Not one part of the brain lights up. Multiple parts light up, usually, which means we don't know what that means. Are they communicating, or are they doing it independently? If you take out one part, will the other one take over? We don't know any of those answer, uh, qu answers to questions, right? So you have to be careful. <laughs> um, so the, but, but anyways, the point of this was, at least we know brain is somewhat modular. There are different functions. So there must be part of the brain that has a visual function. And it turns out to be true. You uh, you look at other sets of patients where they have lesion in their brain, and then they can see. So that part must be responsible some, uh, for the visual function. Now, I'll fast forward a little bit. Let's, let's, let's say we know where the visual parts are in the brain. Now, this concept of receptive field is really important to understand. What this means is this is, this is an eye, not the brain, right? The back of our eye is retina, and this, in retina we have cells that detect light. They get activated by light, and they transmit in terms of electrical activity, and the signal goes to the brain. Right? Now, if you record from one cell in the retina, and you start flashing light all over the screen, so this is someone's eye, and this is the monitor in front of that person or monkey, I don't know. So you start flashing light all over the place, and this neuron only responds if, you, if the light is flashed in this region. So this region is called the receptive field of the neuron. Okay, so if you, if you have a flash of light here, the neuron is silent. You don't, you don't uh, see any firing of the neuron. So this is called the receptive field of the neuron. Now, because the, the topography of the visual cortex is such that all these cells which are adjacent on the, on the retina, it, that, that, that topography is conserved. So what this means is, this is the optic nerve here, it goes to the brain and it goes to the back of the brain, this is the visual cortex. If you record from a neuron here now, and you flash a light on the screen, it also responds, because it's presumably it's the same neuron, right? Now if you, if you record from a neuron next to it, so you move this electrode a little bit, right? This electrode here, you, you take the electrode out and then you just move a little bit to the side. Now that neuron will not respond to the same position anymore. 
you will respond to light, uh, uh, flash of light adjacent to it. Right? So, so this is called retinal topic topo topography. Uh, so the retina topography is con conserved in the brain. So Hubel and Wiesel did a lot of work to demonstrate this, and they, they won the Nobel Prize in 1981 or something for their work. And this is one of them, right? So, well, someone has discovered written topic. They, they did other work, I'll show you in a bit. But you can see this is the screen here. And these uh, black uh, points are the points where light was flashed. And they were able to map exactly what part of the brain responded to this by using some staining technique. Uh, and you can see this, all these points are mapped exactly on the brain. This is the, this is the visual cortex in the back, the, this chunk of the brain. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Now, when I say flash of light, it's, it's just like a circular blob, right? And uh, in fact, they had a lot of problem actually getting any response from the cells here. So when, when, when they were doing this experiment, they actually never got any response when they were flashing sources of uh, blobs of light. And they had a very interesting discovery. And for that, they were awarded the Nobel Prize. And let's watch a video and we can discuss. So this video shows that discovery. Cells firing in the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments, and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen, and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots, onto the screen, and we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we felt. So the sound you hear, the crackling sound, you can, uh, so all, most of your electrical engineers, right? So you can take an electrical signal and then create a sound, right? That's how radio works. So you can all, all, also take a signal from a neuron, feed it to a speaker, and you can actually hear the neurons. And you can put a threshold so that only if there's a, a neural firing, you hear this sound. So it's crackling because it's a, it's a point process. It's not a continuous signal. So every time a neuron fires, you hear a tick. But if it fires a lot, you, then you hear this crackling like sound. So if you hear that sound, it means that the neuron is active. Black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. So, the researchers again? actually listened in to individual nerve cells firing in the anesthetized cat as they presented it with different visual images. When we started working, Torsten and I, in the late 50s, we set up our first experiments and they didn't go well because at the beginning we couldn't make the cells fire at all. We'd shine lights all over the screen and nothing seemed to work. And rather by accident, one day, we were shining small spots, either white spots or black spots onto the screen. And we found that the black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. Did you understand what, what was going on? So we know that there's this neurons have receptor fields. The neurons only respond to a certain part of the screen. But cells in V1, this, this part of the brain, doesn't seem to work. They couldn't get the neurons to fire with blobs of white or dark spots, right? But then it eventually worked. How did it work? Why did the neurons fire? Sorry? Yeah, so it was detecting the edge of the, the, the slide, right? 
back then they didn't have uh, fancy monitors, so they had to use projector and they had to slide the images in. So they wanted to actually show this black blob to the cat, but the process of sliding it in, it, it, it uh, necessarily involves this edge of the slide sweeping through that, uh, the, the, the projector. So that's what excited the neuron. So it, it was a totally accidental discovery. There was no Mars three levels, there was no theory, there was no prediction, it was just accidental, right? And this, this seems to happen quite a bit. Although we have to be grounded in theory, the reality is so complex that you cannot necessarily cover everything. And at the end, something happens and you have accidental discoveries like this. Now this was really a huge deal. So let's talk about this more. Now I'm worried to open it because I might lose it now. So this is what was happening there, right? You're sliding, uh, so you found that, okay, edge excites this neuron. Now you can say, uh, so what they did after that is, you change the orientation of that edge. And it turns out the neurons only respond to a particular orientation of that edge. So this neuron is orientation selective. It only responds to edges, and only certain type of edges. And if you do go to a different neuron, it also only responds to edges, but now it responds to a different orientation of the edge. Uh, by, flat, by showing different orientation of edges, you can actually plot what's called the tuning curve of the neuron. So this neuron is tuned to, uh, well, this one, this neuron is tuned to zero degrees, which is a flat line. Doesn't seem to be that, so it's probably centered. Uh, but you can plot a tuning curve like that. So this particular uh, neuron responds to um, an edge that's oriented at zero degrees, right? The y-axis is the number of firing, number of accent potentials it fires, or number of accent potentials it fired per second. So the y-axis is a proxy of how active the neuron is or how responsive the neuron is. The x-axis is the stimulus uh, orientation space. So this, this was a very interesting and um, fundamental property of the visual system that was discovered, orientation selectivity. And this had many implications. And people came up with models to define. So uh, if you go to retina and you record from a neuron, you see this blob-like receptor fields. And in, you go to V1, you don't see that anymore. You have this oriented receptor fields. How could that be? So one way to, uh, one way to solve that problem is Hubel and Wiesel actually came up with a model to explain that. But if you take, uh, if you take a group of cells from something like retina, or there's an intermediate uh, region visual, uh, on the visual pathway called LGN. It's, a, it's part of the thalamus. That's where the signals go before they reach the brain. So, and they also have receptor fields with uh, circular uh, blobby receptor fields. So if you take a bunch of cells from LGN, and you, you stack them in a certain orientation, and say these, all these cells, these are, these are the LGN cells, right? Each one has each one has its own receptor field next to each other. If all of these cells are actually projecting one neuron, this neuron is going to respond all over this place, right? So you, you flash a light here, this neuron is active and it excites that. I flash a light there, this neuron is active and excites that. But then that doesn't really happen. All of these have to be active at the same time. And now it gets a little bit more complicated because there's on and off reason. But uh, we, can, we can ignore that for now because it's out of the scope of this lecture here. But what the, the takeaway point here is there's this, this is a certain kind of architecture that you can think of. If you stack a bunch of blobby receptor fields, you can end up getting um, an oriented receptor field. And this is, this, is, this is interesting because around the same time, that was when some of the ideas for artificial neural network came about. So this has an implication for convolutional neural network because one of the main ideas of convolutional neural network is the concept of receptor field. So you, uh, so I'll try to explain this. <laughs> I'm not an expert in CNN, but instead of using all the image pixels, you subsample the image pixels and you do it by using the concept of receptor field. Pascal, you want to jump in and explain? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm doing a good job to explain CNN in terms of receptor field. I think we'll just do this very quickly, right? As 
if you're thinking of trying to represent an image, right, and if you do it with uh, a perceptron, then if you had one neuron in your uh, in your architecture for every pixel, you would never be able to. Well, you you could do it, but it would it would require a lot of stuff. Is if you had, let's say, a shape uh, up here and the same shape down here, you would technically want the same response, right? So because it's it's just a displaced object. If you do one neuron per pixel, it's very hard to represent something like that, like an invariance or, in space. Or you take a lot of do. resources. You take exactly the size of the image. You may you need that many number of neurons. No, but even then, you wouldn't be able to because you would have to learn every object in every given yeah, so position. The, so yeah. the square of that. Like, so it's 32 by 32. Yeah, yeah, depending on the number of uh, objects you would have. Okay. But yeah. if, if you want to do it in the, in the same way as a, uh, that's it, as a receptive field, do is like the, the brain is to a certain extent space invariant by doing this. It's basically sampling, that's it, with a set of filters. And I guess we're going to stop there because that's going to be the deep learning lecture. So we're not going to yeah. <laughs> so talk you, about the When you learn about deep learning, they, they're going to talk about convolutional neural network. But, but the idea of convolutional neural network actually came from the concept of receptive field that was found in the visual system of mammalian brain. Now, convolutional neural network also uses another technique, which is, which is what makes it really powerful, is that of backpropagation. Now, a lot of people are looking for biological correlated backpropagation with no success, and we have no evidence of any backpropagation happening in the brain. Maybe we'll find it, but there's absolutely no reason to believe that there's, uh, it's happening in the brain, given what we know about how uh, things work in the brain. So, so the point here is we, we are curious about the brain, and we go and do a bunch of things, and accidentally we discover something. And then that inspires uh, this uh, convolutional neural network, right? So we can go back to that and see where that fits in this framework. So when we talk when we think about AI and neuroscience, yeah sure it seems like you know both 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 the systems are something to do with intelligence. Maybe they can talk to each other. But how exactly we do that is not really clear. But things that have been discovered in neuroscience, sometimes it's accident, sometimes it's really based on theory. Sometimes maybe it's based on psych theories from psychology like uh, the cognitive map theory, but it really had nothing to do with trying to build an intelligent machine. And then you can ask the same question about AI, right? You want to build a machine, you want to build an ex expert system to, do, to automate things. Now, apparently you can do it by using backpropagation and some architecture, right? You don't necessarily need to know how the brain does it. So unless you think in a very structured way, this is one approach, it's really hard to communicate between the two fields. So it's not very trivial when people say, well, we want to we learn from neuroscience and develop better tools of AI, or we can use AI to get better understanding of the brain. You really have to think about how exactly you want to do that. So Mars' approach is one way to think about it, but it's just an approach. Just using this approach doesn't magically give you the answer, right? Um, so, uh, so that was the point, and I also wanted to introduce you to the concept of firing, neural firing, and receptive fields, and all those things. Now, let's go back to this approach and think about the navigation problem now. We have a theory about logic, these two logics, right? Using a map uh, or not using a map. And then we, we thought of some algorithms. Now, let's see if, if we can actually find something in the brain that might hint one or the other is happening. Now, to do that, we also need to do some background research. Hippocampus is a part of the brain. So have you heard of Alzheimer's disease? Yes. What, are the, wh what is the main thing that happens uh, when someone gets Alzheimer's? I can't hear it. Memory loss, right? So, so you start, what you lose first is you cannot form new memories, and then you start losing your memory from the, from the past. It turns out that when people get Alzheimer's disease, the first part of the brain that starts losing your tissue is the hippocampus. We didn't know that before. That, so, uh, so that indicates hippocampus is somehow involved in memory, right? But before that, 
a person called Brenda Milner, who is a professor at McGill University, where I did my PhD, and she's 100 years old, and she goes to work every day, even now. She, she did very interesting work back in 1950s on, on people who had lesion in the hippocampus. So she devised very, so she didn't do any recordings or anything like that. She just did um, uh, psychology experiments with these patients. So she designed very careful experiments to, to probe their ability to remember things. Right? And it turns out that, uh, so, so because of her work, the, the field of really uh, cognitive psychology and memory got a lot of momentum. So you can read uh, some of the quotation from her paper. Um, so the last one I like particularly is like, he will do the same jigsaw puzzles day after day without showing any practice effect. So he, he can totally learn to solve a puzzle, but the next day he just he has no idea what he did yesterday, right? And so one of the comments from people who worked with these patients is also. The, 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 the professor has been working with these patients for months and months, right? But every single day, the professor comes in and introduces her, herself because the person has no idea who that person is. So we can go, go into details of this experiment, which is also interesting. But my point here was to point towards hippocampus. So there's some indication that this part of the brain has something to do with memory. So if the rat is remembering things or building something, that he has to remember, maybe it's there. So, so this idea led um, some people to study the hippocampus, right? Now, um, there's another lesion study that I want to mention before I go into physiology. So this is this is called Morris Water Maze, de designed by Richard Morris. What you do is you create a pool, and rats can swim pretty well. You create a pool and you drop the rat in the pool somewhere, and he has to get to a platform to get a reward. And the platform is just under the surface of water, so you don't see where it is, because the water is filled with color. It's like completely white. So you don't see what's underwater, it's not transparent. So the rat has to move around, and after uh, foraging or navigating, he's gonna realize the platform is somewhere, right? So you can see his learning curve over here. So this is, uh, the amount of time he takes to find the platform, and x-axis is trials, basically. So in the beginning, he, he can't find it. He just go, he, so these this lines, these black lines, are the trajectory of the rat. He's just going around and around. This, re, uh, this black dot is the platform. And then in the start, he can't really find anything. He takes a long time, and then he gets better and better. Eventually, he knows exactly where it is, and he goes there. Now look at the behavior of the rat when the hippocampus is lesioned. Right, so after, after many training, they actually don't really improve. So they lesion the hippocampus in different ways. There are other structures around the hippocampus. So you can lesion it, uh, lesion that uh, location by either putting high current in there or like, um, there are different ways you can cool it down. There are different ways to do it. You, you can do it pharmacologically by um, putting some uh, chemical that kills the tissue. So there, there are different ways to do it. But after you listen, the rat doesn't really know how to navigate. So this also indicates that okay, the hippocampus of the rat is somehow involved in navigation. Now what people did was, this was done uh, by uh, John O'Keefe, he's a professor at U U University College London, and he did most of his PhD uh, at McGill University, so this was back in the 60s. So when Brenda Milner's work was being really uh, popular, he decided to record from the hippocampus while, while the rat was running around, not, not in a water maze, but just in an um, open ground, so in a square box, for example. So he was recording from the cells in the hippocampus, and the rat was just going around, and then the cell starts firing randomly at a, at a particular place, right? So if this, if this is the box, the rat is just going around, and this particular hippocampal cell that the researcher is recording from only fires when the rat is near that camera. But if he records from another cell, and this cell only fires if the rat is in that location. The rat is going around, the cell is completely silent, it only fires there, right? So 
there are cells in the hippocampus that, re that encode the place. So they called it place cells. So on the left there, that's an example of a place cell. The, the black lines are the trajectory of the rats, and the red dots is when the cell fired. Right? So the rat is going around, and it only fires in that particular location. If you record from another neuron, it would be a different place. Right? On the right is a different type of cell. So this was found in interranial cortex. It's, it's a structure next to the hippocampus. And this is, this is an interesting one. So what this means is here the rat is also going around. This is one single cell, right? And the, and the neuron fires, this, this cell fires at particular locations, multiple locations in the, uh, in the open area. It takes some time to digest this. Think about, uh, think about Cartesian coordinates. What do you have in there if you have a graph paper? You have a grid, right? You can create a grid. So it turns out that this thing, it, it's called a grid cell, because if you, if you connect all the central, uh, uh, if you connect the centers of all these blobs, they form a hexagonal pattern. And it's very intact. You uh, again record from another cell in the internal cortex, and they will also have a grid pattern. What changes across cells is the scale of things. So it, it could be f firing here, 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 here. So it's like twice the frequency, right? Or it could be half the frequency. So different grid cells have different scales, but they have this hexagonal pattern. And then there's another type of cell called place cells that only fires at a particular location. Now, they have also found other types of cells, for example, head direction cell. That is, just like orientation tuning, this cell is tuned to which direction the rat is turning, right? So that will be an internal signal. And then there's other, other type of cell. I, I haven't put it here, but it's called border cell. So it only fires if the rat is along the border. So the, these different types of phenomenal cells are in the hippocampal formation. And uh, Edward and Mary Britt Moser, they're Norwegians, and John O'Keefe, they no awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in 2014 for discovering this phenomenon. Now, the reason I showed you this is, this is not a proof that there's a cognitive map in the brain of the rat, right? But if there's a grid cell, and if there, there's a cell that is encoding place in a Euclidean space, that is some hint that, okay, there, is there something going on with Euclidean geometry, right? So there's a lot of theoretical work that has been done on how we can use hexagonal grid patterns to navigate. So um, we can talk about this more. You can ask me questions later. But I just want to, I just wanted to give you an idea of what is known in in this particular field of navigation. But then, remember, we have to be critical, right? So this, this is discovered. It's great. It's really nice. Does that tell you how navigation happens? Did that, does that tell you how the rat figured out where to, where to reach? It doesn't really tell you. you know? It gives you a hint of how things might be done. Maybe there's some sort of computational unit that does vector calculation based on these things. We, people have come up with ways to do it. Well, that's fine. That's nice. People have come up with the level two algorithm, like Mars level two algorithm, how vector-based calculation can be done if you have cells that encode places. But then you also have to show that that vector calculation is being ha is done in the brain. If you really want to prove this is uh, the basis of a something like a cognitive map, Euclidean map. So that we don't know yet. In fact, this was, so this was, place cell was discovered in the 1960s and the grid cell was discovered in 2004. Uh, so from 1960, it's been a long time. We still actually don't know if place cell is used to navigate. There's no, there's no causal proof to show that this is actually used when rats navigate. And people have found that in humans as well, and in bats. So bats actually live in, um, um, at night, right? They live in dark environment, and they have a 3D uh, sort of uh, place cells. So there, people have found places in the 3D. This is 2D because bats fly. They have found 3D. Uh, they, have they have found places in 3D space. So it seems to be existing everywhere across species, 
So there's very, something very interesting going on, right? So this is phenomenon. This, we have discovered a phenomenon, and we can keep studying this. That would be phenomenology, right? But then the question of, usually people get into neuroscience to understand how the brain works. But phenomenology doesn't really answer that question. But how the brain works is you really want to understand the mechanism or the representation or some computation the brain does. But finding phenomenon in the brain doesn't really help you directly. It might help you shape your theories, but it doesn't help you directly. To, to understand, you have to do more sophisticated experiments to test your theories. So let's say you come up with a model that uses this type of cells that helps in navigation. What does that model predict? So if you disable these cells, what will happen? That's one way to think about it. But then, then there's another problem. How do you disable these cells? And these are like all over the place on interval cortex, right? If you, if you disable one part of tissue, that will impact many other things, not just that cells. So just disabling will not really work. It might work roughly, but then precisely it will not work. So these are the type of questions that people ask in uh, computational neuroscience. So you want to know the computational principle. You want to know how things are being computed. And then you have some phenomenal cells, some discoveries that help you shape your theories, uh, but then you don't know the answer. So the way to go about it is you come up with a computational model and predict what will happen. So you can even predict firing rate. So if you, if you make the rat run in a particular way, you design a maze where he has to make a decision, you conf confuse him in different ways, and then predict what he does, that would be his behavioral prediction, and predict what, the, what kind of firing rate would you expect based on your neural model. So these are the sort of things that happens in computational neuroscience. Um, so I'm heading towards the end of the slide now. So what have we learned so far? The first three are from the previous section. Humans outperform AI to generalize what's learned. We have made, many, we have made much progress in our understanding of how animal and human cognition works. Yeah, I can possibly draw from neuroscience research to make projects. We, can, we have seen one example, but is there a way to draw more from neuroscience? Is there a way neuroscience can use machine learning tools? These are something, some things to think about. Uh, one Mars three level of analysis is one way to approach a problem, whether it's in AI or whether it's in neuroscience or maybe some other things. And brain has phenomenal neurons. This phenomenology is quite a thing in neuroscience. You know, they award new Nobel Prizes when you discover things. But does that help you understand how the brain works? It's, it's always the fundamental question, and people are working on that. So that's why we, we still don't know why these cells are there and how it's used at all if it's used for vector navigation. Vector calculation, sorry. So why is neuroscience relevant? AI is trying to build intelligent agents. Neuroscience is trying to understand how the brain works, how we're trying to understand ourselves. So how can we build intelligence without understanding intelligence? And you can think of the answers you gave this morning with this question, right? Some of us said that we want to build AI that can increase our intelligence. Or some, some of us said there was one term where Someone said we want to build superhuman doctors, right? So what does that mean? We have to think about that. Can we build intelligence which is even better than uh, what we have when we don't even know what we have? You can put it that way. Maybe the answer is yes. So with that, I'm at the end of my session and open for questions. <laughs>